just continue. Um, all right. So uh, I'm Shane Caraveo. I am with uh, Mozilla. I'm in a group uh, that we call Labs. It's a relatively small group at this point. Um, and we do a lot of various uh, kind of experiments around ideas and stuff that some of them end up in products, some of them don't. Um, <clears throat> And I'm very happy to follow somebody who did their slides last night because after watching talks yesterday, I did my slides over again this morning. <laughs> so my slides are an experiment. This talk is an experiment. I don't know if it's gonna go really fast or really long. Um, and uh, in the flavor of that, I also lost all my speaker notes not having my screen. Uh, so um, I, I work, uh, specifically on a thing called Social API, which I'll get to in a little bit. Um, I want to give some background kind of on some thought patterns. Uh, and one of the things that I wanted to kind of ask was, uh, what do you know about your users? But then I realized, well, everybody or most everybody here are developing APIs and their users are other developers, and so that's not really the question I wanted to ask. I want to turn you into users, and I want to ask, what does the web know about you? Um, I'm not talking about Google or the NSA or something like that. I'm, I'm asking about the web. Um, in Mozilla, we have a term that we use to kind of describe this, which is the web is the platform. And we use that to kind of describe kind of a belief system we have around how standards are an important part of what we do, how HTML, CSS, JavaScript are the, is the platform. It's the vehicle through which users actually perceive anything they do on the internet. Um, so I've got a little experiment I'm gonna try here. This is the first time I've done something like this. Uh, I, I would like everybody to raise their right hand for a minute. Everybody. Great, I'll take you, 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 and you. Thank you for volunteering. <laughs> um, yeah, so stand up for just a second. You don't have to come up on stage. Um, and uh, let's see, or you can come up on stage, that's okay. Uh, either way, um, but I know you've been taking pictures. Um, can I see your phone for a second? Okay, so I've got some pictures of his here, fun stuff. Uh, actually, I'm not actually going to go into them. Well, maybe I will. Um, so this is Mr. T, this is Mr. G, this is Mr. F. And you want to share your picture, right? Who can I give your pictures to? All of them? You don't care? Oh, you're, not a, you're not a good user. <laughs> oh, something. Yeah, yeah. Okay, here, you've got all those pictures now. Um, all right, so I was actually hoping for somebody a little more stingy on, on sharing, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Um, but my point is you only have three choices, right? Like, that's all you get. That's what's on the web today, right? You pretty much go to any website, that's what you get. Um, I'll give you your phone back. But thank you, you can all sit down. Um, there's, nothing on, there's nothing on the web as a platform that would let the web know, like actually what does he use? Does he use all three of these people? Does he use something else? What's, you know, what is it that as a user uh, is important? Um, this, so this is just the illustration of the previous illustration. Uh, this is what a lot of websites look like to me these days, and it drives me a little bit nuts. Um, because it limits my choice as a user. I don't really have a choice here. I'm actually, I'm a Facebook user. My name is Shane, I use Facebook. Um, I also use Twitter, I also use Google. But my perception of choice is that if I wanna use something else, if I wanna change what I do, in the world, um, I'm, not getting, I'm not getting this option from the web. And there's a good reason for it. APIs are actually a big part of the problem. Um, 
how can a single website support a dozen, uh, a dozen APIs, 100 APIs, 1,000? Uh, there was an earlier talk where uh, somebody said by 2017 or whatever, I don't remember the year, there's going to be something like a million or 10 million APIs. How does, how does the web deal with that? And how, does, how, how do websites continue to give choice to users? Um, how many people have ever read the Mozilla Manifesto? There's a, there's a few hands. How many people here know that Mozilla is a nonprofit organization? Awesome. That's great. How many people know that there's also a corporation? Okay, cool. Um, yeah, the corporation is solely owned by the foundation which is the nonprofit. Uh, it's kind of a tax structure in the US. Um, I guess we kind of hacked the tax structure. Uh, anyway, this is one principle out of uh, the Mozilla Manifesto. And I, I kind of pulled it out because I like this one. Um, it kind of points out kind of some of my own feelings about how the internet should work for me as a user. Um, that is that I should be able to have the choices that I choose and not have somebody else make those choices for me. A terrible thing for me is I get dry mouth when I talk in front of people. So I'm coming back here to get my water. So I also want to introduce kind of some veins of thought that are pretty prevalent in Mozilla. Um, uh, last year, we did a number of summits, and, and the theme of the summits were many voices, one Mozilla. Right? Mozilla is made up of a lot of people who um, are attracted to the, to the mission of the organization. Um, and within that, there's just a whole uh, kind of society of voices, a whole bunch of different opinions. But there are a lot of common veins. Um, and as I was thinking about this, uh, and I was talking to um, one of the UX managers, uh, who's actually in Paris as well at the same time, and he showed me these slides. And I was like, oh, can I use a couple of these slides? Because they actually really express pretty well like a common theme that's in Mozilla right now. And these were actually for an internal pitch, but he was like, yeah, you can take a couple of them. So uh, this is kind of a problem that's on a lot of people's minds, is all of, the, all of the information that users have and how that information is handled on the internet um, and how users don't have any kind of capacity often to control that data. And so the pitch is kind of, what if Firefox kind of knew how to do that? Like, what if Firefox knew how to connect things together for users? Um, if we could do that, and we could do that in a way that makes sense for users, what would that look like? Um, you know, if I'm ever a user, uh, I think this kind of goes to some of the, like the data control issues in, from the previous talk. Uh, I might want to store my data on Google Drive. And maybe six months down the road, I decide, you know what, I don't really like some of Google's policies. I want to change that to something else. I want to change it to Dropbox, or I'm going to run my own, right? But to be able to do that, Evernote would have to support all of those things. What if Evernote just knew how to tell the browser to save this data for the user, and the browser knew that the user uses Google Drive, and the browser could send it to Google Drive for the user? Um, could that be potentially a better way? Um, this is kind of a phrase, I don't remember who said it, and I picked up on it, and I really liked it. It's, it's kind of putting the agent back into user agent. We've had these user agents forever, right? Web browsers, cell phones, smartphones now. Um, and they all handle our data. They're kind of the, the nexus of our interface to the, to the rest of the world. 
Um, so out of that, your user agent can know an incredible amount of information about you. Um, we have an experiment uh, that's called up right now. It's user, user profile or user preferences, something like that. Uh, I think maybe six months or a year ago, there was an experiment done where we had a bunch of users using one of our um, kind of test pilot programs. And we did analysis of the browsing history of users and categorized that browsing history to see whether or not we could come up with a set of topics that users found interesting. I like sports, I like cooking, I like stuff like that, purely out of a person's browsing history. Um, it's possible. And the, very, the really very awesome thing about it is that Mozilla doesn't have to know anything about that. It happens on your user agent. It can happen on your phone, in your browser, and so forth. So if we can kind of start actually turning user agents into more than just a window to the world and into an active participant for the user, uh, what more can we do? And is that scary? Like, is it, is it scary to think of having a piece of software under your control, no, I'll actually do analysis of all these things uh, about you, right? Uh, I think Google probably does an immense amount of analysis about me. I think Facebook does. I think everything else does. I find those things more scary than having something that's my own tool. Oh, where am I? Okay. Um, some Mozilla principles. So I wanted to throw in a couple more things in here. Um, just to kind of give a little bit more context. Because when we talk about doing these types of things, um, we have a lot of self-imposed constraints. We have privacy policies that we go through. We have data review policies that we go through. Um, we're, we're very strongly a client-sided organization, although we're getting into some services. Um, everything that we do has to follow kind of like our manifesto and kind of our privacy um, principles and all these policies. So I wanted to point a couple of them out just because I think they're, they're, uh, they're important when we think about handling user data, even when it's only on the client. So the stuff that I do, I like to think of as being a sliver of kind of this idea, a sliver of this concept. Um, and that sliver is how do we start to address the possibility to even get to a place where a user has a choice in what services they're using in their client. Um, like how do you install those things? How do you manage them? How do you do all that? And how do you keep that as the web as the platform? Not have add-ons that are written specifically for Firefox or specifically for Chrome or IE or some other strange thing. How do you actually make this be something that's web, that web developers can use and they don't have to think about kind of the browser stuff? So. Like I said earlier, I work on this thing called Social API. Um, this was actually started in conjunction with Facebook um, as a project uh, probably about a year and a half ago. And it was based on a bunch of concepts that we had been working on in labs uh, for a while. Um, the thing about this is that it's not really an API. It's, and it's not necessarily about social. We focused on a set of use cases that we think are important for the web, which happen to be social use cases. Um, but it could be kind of, there's a whole lot more I think that's possible uh, both in the browser and in other people's imaginations of what they could do. All right, so I'm gonna speed up because I'm going quite slow. So like I said, um, we had a few specific use cases. Uh, we wanted to address sharing. 
Uh, we wanted to have a, a good way for notifications to work. Um, communication, save for later, is a big one. Organizations like Pocket and Evernote and stuff like that that have kind of those note-taking types of functionality or bookmarking type of functionality but in the cloud. Uh, and those are the kind, kinds of things that I've been focused on. Uh, what Social API has right now is a set of UI components. Um, there's a sidebar, uh, there's notifications which can be like just kind of little ambient uh, numbers on buttons, um, or it can be more in your face like growl notifications. Uh, we've got share and bookmarking panels. And the, the kind of the trick in the system is that as a provider in the system, you get a web worker, which runs in the background, and that allows you to do several things, um, such as uh, polling for notifications and stuff. There are some new APIs that we'll be bringing in that will hopefully replace that, uh, because that is some overhead. Um, so I'll just kind of show, uh, rather than doing any demo or anything, I'm showing some images. So on ambient notifications, uh, so there are app tabs in Firefox that have been around for a long time, and websites have used a trick of modifying the fave icon to show kind of an ambient glow or a number, and what we're doing is we're taking that and we're turning it into an actual toolbar button where you can have your, your different types of notifications available. Those have uh, panels that drop down. Those panels are HTML. There's nothing really special about it. Whoops, wrong direction. Um, this is something special. We do have a couple of little APIs that are browser specific that basically let you do a couple of special things. So this is a flyout uh, that can hover, hover over web pages. Um, so there is a different API for opening that other than window.open. This is the share button uh, with the panel. Again, this is standard HTML. Um, Facebook didn't even have to do anything for us to add a Facebook share panel to Firefox. This already existed. This functionality was really designed around a few different concepts that have been around for quite a while, such as OExchange, um, in order to provide uh, kind of simplified sharing experiences. This lets you get away from that kind of NASCAR of buttons for sharing um, and lets the user share with what services they use on any web page, whether the buttons exist or not. I'm gonna speed up a little bit more. Uh, this is another experiment in Mozilla, which I'll just mention because I use this as an example for the chat windows. Um, so Mozilla's been very involved with WebRTC. Um, this is a provider that does WebRTC video conferencing. Uh, lately in Mozilla, we've really gotten into horse heads. Uh, but uh, I just kind of wanted to show that because this is something different um, that another group came up with. They decided to use Social API, and Firefox needed no modifications or technically no, no modifications for them to do that work. Uh, I was gonna go through a little bit of this stuff, but I, I kinda talked about the UP project. I've talked about Social API, which is kind of the primary thing I work on. Some of the things that are still missing um, in, in kind of my worldview of pulling the web more into services that the user has enabled are things like web activities, or in the Google world, it would be Android Intents or Web Intents. Um, communications between providers uh, and the push API. These are all things that we've actually done for Firefox OS on the mobile platform that we just need to like get into the desktop platform. Uh, and so that's kind of it, um, since I'm running out of time. I am not going to do a, any kind of live demo. This is some of my information. Um, if you search for Mixed Puppy on Twitter or a number of other places, you'll actually find me. And that's kind of it. There's the last word.
good students are always in front of <laughs> Hi. Um, I was wondering two things. Uh, what are the outlooks for the compatibility with other browsers? I guess it's not easy, but I hope you have a way. And is there a way to totally not see Facebook at all? Facebook at all? Sorry. You don't have to see Facebook. Thank Every, you. Everything, everything that's in there is, it's, you've activated it, right? Sorry? A any, anything that you would see in there, you activate. Okay. You as the user activate it. So you would actually have to go to Facebook's website. You would have to find the page that they don't market right now. You would have to hit the turn on button to get Facebook and Firefox like that. Okay, and do you, would you have a, a database between the application that, that I mean several applications can uh, use together, or is it a per application database in the browser? So, so the, first, the first issue we're trying to address is like how do we, get, how do we get actually get services into the browser in a, in a useful fashion um, with some use cases that are common on the internet. Uh, one of the things, one of the kind of future things I want to do is have a way for those services that the user installed to have like a, a web socket between each other, right? But that would be controlled by the user. So for example, I showed Talkila, which is a WebRTC app. It needs contacts, right? So if you had Google installed, Talkila could say, I need contacts, and the user can say, oh, get, get my Google contacts, right? Um, so the, those types of operations where it's under control of the user. But no shared database type of stuff or anything like that. I have time for one more question. Oh, actually, I wanted to answer one more thing he asked. There was two questions so this in there. Is the I'm two sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, browser compatibility was the other thing, and I, I actually get that question quite a bit. Um, so I was at a W3C social workshop in in San Francisco a little while ago, and and I had the same question. Uh, kind of in regards to standardization. Are we going to try and standardize this? And my answer is no, not right now. We're not going to try and standardize it. The reason is is because we don't know, A, is this going to, is this going to work out? We've got a number of providers that we're going to be announcing in January that we've been working with to get up on the system. Um, but is it going to be something that users are actually going to find interesting? Um, are we missing things in, in the system that it's not going to work, that we have to adjust? Um, stuff like that. Uh, we have, you know, at that point where we are like, okay, we have some validation, then I think it's time to branch out and like talk to the other browser vendors and see if we can get them interested in it as well. Because ultimately something like this would be much better if it were uh, kind of across the board everywhere. So it was not the last question, but the last answer. So thank you, Shane. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. If you have any questions, I'll, I'm around. Just ask.